This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 25th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts both on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss SB 199, what some have called the cornerstone of a fiscal plan, but which we believe is substantially flawed. Second, as we enter the final three weeks of this year's legislative session, we discuss what the end game is beginning to look like to some observers. Third, we discuss one factor elevating Alaska oil prices even over the benchmark for Brent over the past few weeks. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start things off this morning by dissecting SB 199, which, I, as I mentioned earlier, seems to be the vehicle of choice for the pro-government spend crowd in the legislature. Uh, you notice I'm not saying left or right or Democrat or Republican because that's where the dividing line, it seems to be. It's the pro-private sector, protect the private sector crowd versus protecting the public sector crowd. And the public sector folks uh, are in love with this bill. They're seeing it as a way to end run around a lot of what the governor has been proposing while putting hooks and caveats into this into the years moving forward. I don't know exactly how we're getting away with this whole, um, you know, this uh, this caveated language where they they make everything contingent on something that's going to happen years down the road. But let's uh, get Brad Keithley's take on this. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Michael. How are you doing today? You know, not too bad. Um, so, I mean, I guess maybe can you comment on that before you dive into the meat of what you want to talk about? You know, we we never seen this really before until about two years ago where they started hanging contingencies on all these different bills. Well, this bill will pass if something else happens in this session or next session or down the road, or this is kind of the what if scenario. And and I think it's, it's, it's reaching perilously close on binding one legislature over to another. And I don't know exactly how they're getting away with it, but do you have any comments on that before we jump into the meat of this? Well, it's sort of a Burt special, and, and it probably probably predated Burt as well. But I noticed he's used this several times since, oh, 2008, 2009, 2010, when I first started following the legislature uh, very closely. Um, and it's sort, of, it's sort of how he does things. It doesn't bind future legislatures because, you know, you can enact it. Uh, to, <laughs> it's a statute, for one thing. You can enact it today, and, the, and a future legislature can ignore it. Uh, you can uh, you can enact it today, and a future legislature can repeal it, or change it, or modify it. Um, it's more it, it is it's sort of a statutory version, an attempt at a statutory version of it of of intent language. Um, right. We, we sort of hope that future legislatures will 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 do this uh, if we if we do that. But we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, and uh, and we'll sort of we'll sort of count on future future legislatures to do something else. I mean, it, you can look at the PFD as the same sort of thing. PFD was passed in 1982. Legislature said, uh, we hope that uh, uh, you know we, we're going to pass this statute. We intend for the statute to be followed. Uh, we expect future legislatures to follow it. And then future and then beginning in 2016, 2017, the legislatures haven't followed it. But it's a it's a Burt deal. Um, I, I've noticed it uh, mostly when uh, when he's uh, crafting language. Right. Somehow he gets involved and all of a sudden it gets all these bells and whistles and hooks attached to it. It's 
It's uh, well, it's frustrating to me to watch, but I guess that's what it is. So let's anyway, let's talk about SB 199. Um, it is, again, the chosen vehicle. This is the one they seem to be rolling with. 50-50 the first year, twenty five seventy five for the next four years until we discover $800 million in new revenue, apparently. Uh, and then it goes back to 50-50. But this thing's got to go to the floor, and it's going to have to survive a lot of amendment processes to get through it. What what are your what are your thoughts on this? Give me your give me your take on one ninety nine. Well, this is a bad bill. I mean, it's a it, it's a it started out as a bad bill uh, uh, when it was first introduced. It was in, introduced as a as a comparison piece to a Senate Bill two hundred, which had another approach to the PFD, um, and it stayed a bad bill all the way through. It says in the preamble that it's an implementation of the fiscal policy working group. Uh, recommendations, <laughs> but it is far from it is far from that. The fiscal policy working group said, and this is in their conclusion, fiscal policy working group believes the legislature must pass a comprehensive solution. Fiscal policy working group members do not support addressing only one or two issues to the exclusion of others. The fiscal policy working group believes addressing these issues as a comprehensive solution solves not only a fiscal challenge but a political challenge as well. Well. This bill f- does not remotely touch on several of the pieces uh, of the uh, of the that the work, fiscal policy working group did. For example, it doesn't have a constitutional protection for the PFD. It doesn't include a spending cap. It doesn't include other things that the fiscal policy working group recommended. What it does do is cut the PFD uh, permanently, but 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 or p- cut the PFD, but makes that contingent on coming up with some new revenues, which is the the new revenues part is consistent with what the fiscal policy working group said, but the new revenues they want is far, are far in excess of what's necessary to balance the budget if you use uh, POMV 50-50. So it is far from uh, an implementation of the the fiscal policy uh, working group. Right. Doesn't have all the plans, it it cherry picks cherry picks pieces uh, uh, of the, uh, of the plan, the plan that, as you say, the pro-government spenders uh, uh, find to their advantage. And then it leaves behind uh, all of the pieces that, uh, that, that others found important uh, in crafting a full fiscal policy uh, uh, solution. Right. And again, picking, picking the pieces, this is exactly what the fiscal policy working group warned about. Uh, It wasn't just the PFD. It wasn't just new revenues. It wasn't just cuts in spending and a spending limit. I mean, these those were all things that were part and parcel of it. And they picked like two out. Like we're going to take the PFD and we're going to take new revenues. And even like you said, the eight hundred million dollars in revenues that that they're asking for. Uh, I think the number that came out of the fiscal policy working group was somewhere around two hundred million dollars that they talked about in new revenues, plus some cuts, plus some new oil taxes. I mean, it was kind of a whole. You know, the 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 all around approach was uh, was a little broader than what they've got here. Well, the fiscal policy working group talked about five to seven hundred million dollars in new revenues, offset by uh, roughly two hundred million dollars in spending cuts uh, uh, developed over, uh, as the, as the fiscal policy working group said, developed over multiple years. So a net, a net of somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred to five hundred million dollars between the new revenues and the in uh, the spending cuts. Um, this talks about eight hundred million dollars in new revenue. I mean, it picks a number that's not even in the fiscal policy working group recommendation. Uh, talks about eight hundred million dollars. Doesn't talk about spending cuts. So it's a net of eight hundred million dollars. The analysis we've done of, of POMB fifty fifty shows that over the ten years, using current uh, uh, oil market futures, the current futures prices, what people are putting money on uh, uh, to uh, in expectation of what the prices are going to be in the future, adjusting spending for, for current inflation rates, which are higher than, uh, than the administration used to net. So we're, we're getting spending up to, to reflect uh, what the expectations of our, our inflation. POMV 50, making those adjustments, POMV 5050 shows a net surplus of, between now and, and FY30, a net surplus uh, a net uh, uh, a budget surplus of $2.4 billion. So if you look at it over the eight-year period, you don't need any additional revenues to implement uh, POMB 5050. Even in the last year, even in, in, in FY30, 
the net deficit of POMB 5050 is $400 million. So even if you're looking at this bill, and, and this bill implements the $800 million in two years, so you're, you're, you know, you're running up surpluses uh, uh, on top of surpluses uh, uh, in, the, in the early years, but even if you look at this bill as trying to set the revenue requirement, trying to, trying to establish the revenues needed in, by FY30, by using uh, 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 POMB 5050, you're still double uh, the revenues they need. So, what you know, the, the way I view what they're doing with this revenue with this revenue requirement is sort of an exit fee. You get out of the jail of POMB 2575 uh, if you pay this 800 million dollar exit fee, but the exit fee is is far in excess of what's required. So, you know, I would even oppose that exit fee. Uh, because it's just way too much. You're putting way too. You're draining way too much out right. of the out of the the private sector and putting way too much uh, in government. You're creating government surpluses on on top of surpluses. Well, and so I I view this exit fee as more a a a poison pill, if you will, that that they're they're sort of you know they're doing POMB twenty five will tell you that you know we've got this intent to go to POMB's fifty fifty. Uh, at some point in the future, but the price we're going to put on how you get to POMB 5050 is so high that you'll never enact it. So, right. so well, guess what? We win. We get to well, POMB 2575 in perpetuity because under the bill, if you don't, if you don't have those additional revenues by the end of 24, I think it is, um, 2024, then you never go back to POMB 50. Right. The, the, the bill locks in at POMB 2575. So it's a, it, it is, it's disingenuous right. to say that this bill is an implementation of the, of the fiscal policy working group. And it's disingenuous to say that this bill really sets up going back to POMB 5050 because it, puts in a poison pill that you'll never exercise. Well, and it has the added benefit, again, of feeding into this false narrative that the uh, a lot of the pro-spend, uh, pro-government uh, folks have got that basically says, oh, do you want to trade a, a tax for your PFD? Because, again, that's what they're tying it all to. They're tying it all to these new forms of revenue, which is, of course, the assumption is it will be some form of taxation. And so that's that's the thing. It feeds right back into that narrative of do you want to, do you want a tax or do you want a PFD? And that's kind of uh, it's helping feed that whole thing. It is, and it's. Um, I, I mean, we've talked about this a lot on the show. Even at POMB, certainly at the statutory PFD, even at POMB fifty fifty by the late twenty twenties and by FY twenty thirty, uh, you, you're running deficits. You you do need alternate revenues in order to avoid uh, PFD cuts uh, in those years. So it 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 is it is. Um, it, it is it is correct in the same way that the fiscal policy working group talked about it. If you're going to have a PFD of a certain size, you're going to need alternate revenues to fill in the to fill in the gaps. But because they because they put this eight hundred million dollar price tag on it, uh, they made it seem like you have to enact so much in new taxes that you know that you'd never you would never want to you'd never be able successful in. Uh, in being able to pass those to uh, to uh, sustain the sustain the PFD again from the from my old corporate lawyer days this is this is the equivalent of a poison pill you put in a provision that you know no one will ever pursue uh, because it's just it, you know it's it's, right. it's a ridiculous provision well and the bottom line is is that it's really toothless in the long run like you said disingenuous because again this is all statutory they could say this this year they could pass and then next year they could go well you know we thought that but of course such circumstances have changed and so now we've decided we can't do that after all because and since it's a statute we can do whatever the hell we want i mean that's really the whole that's the bottom line disingenuousness of it yeah it's a it's a it's a fig leaf. I am I am really surprised to tell you the honest gosh truth. I am really surprised uh, at how Peter Machecki was quoted on this bill uh, in the ADN article. Uh, it starts out and says uh, Senate President Peter Machecki said a vote could take place as soon as next week. It is very important, depending upon any amendments that happen in this bill. This is the cornerstone of a fiscal plan. Well. If this is the cornerstone of a fiscal plan that he has in mind, I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not sure 
Machecki and I are on this um, on the same right. wavelength. It's, it's the cornerstone of a fiscal plan that uh, that that, a, as you say, uh, secures uh, revenues for for those who want to right. not only continue. I mean, this doesn't only continue government spending. This 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 expands and encourages resources right. for, for yeah. government spending by by substantial amounts. Yeah, absolutely. It's like your cornerstone is built uh, a big uh, 4,000 square foot McMansion on the edge of the beach with the sand washing away underneath. That's the kind of foundation we're talking about here. I read the same thing when, as I was reading this article in the ADN about the new formula and everything. And the comments from Machiki on this is, it, you know, somehow this is what we've been looking for. This is, this is the answer. This is the solution. Um, and the problem is, of course, is that the solution has come across the floor several times in the last couple of years, we could have just committed to something. We could have just committed to the full PFD. We could have committed to uh, fighting and working towards a constitutional amendment for the PFD. I mean, there's been several other things. This seems like a pretty flimsy thing for the Senate president to want to hang his hat on. Yeah, it's 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 almost, Michael, it's almost like I want to claim victory over something. You know, it's, it's almost like the George Bush appearance uh, on the aircraft carrier saying, you know, <laughs> mission accomplished right uh it doesn't doesn't really matter doesn't seem to really matter what the heck the what, what the heck the bill says is i just want to claim victory i want to claim that you know while i, I was senate president i accomplished uh, a fiscal solution but it's a horrible it's a horrible solution i mean uh, pomb 2575 produces a 10 billion dollar surplus over the eight years between fy 23 and fy 30 it drains out of the Alaska private sector economy. Ten billion dollars shifts that over to uh, shifts that over to uh, over to government. That's more than a billion dollars a year, on average, in uh, in in the transfer of money in the private sector over to uh, over to uh, the government sector. It's a horrible bill, and 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 there's no need for it. Um, uh, given the projections that we now have on oil prices, even given the projections we have on inflation, there's no need for it. But it's just, I want to declare victory. I want to say we got this accomplished. Right. So, right. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what, I don't know what Peter's doing, but it's not, it's not, it's not something I would have suggested he do. Uh, about two minutes here before we rejoin. So let, you know, let's, you know, let me slide you into the shoes of some of these legislators. Give me your thoughts on maybe the mindset of the process. As you said, we've got a projected surplus. We could pay the 50-50, no problem. I mean, not the statutory because that creates other problems, but if it's 50-50, at least they could pay that with no problem, still have monies left over and, and and moving on. What I mean, what is the thought process here? Is it just we need to protect 10 years down the road or we need to make sure the government always has their hand in the till or what is the what what do you think? I think I think it's a couple of things. One is, I think there is a concern about oil prices going back down. I mean, we've had a history of oil prices going up, oil prices going back down. And I think there's a concern about oil prices going back down and they don't want to, and they, and they want to build up some cushion and they don't want to get locked into what they think are, uh, are, are unreasonable uh, uh, financial commitments uh, if oil prices go back down. I think the other thing that's going on is, is Frank, and this sort of is from the Natasha standpoint, it's frankly, we've come to a moment in time where maybe we can kill the PFD uh, or at least get it down to the minimus levels like 2575. We've come to that moment in time. Let's not let that get away from us. Let's continue the rhetoric. Let's continue the arguments that we've been using up to this point, regardless of what's happened to oil prices. Let's get the PFD taken out. Right, and I think I think to some degree Natasha uh, and others uh, of, of that mindset, uh, that's where they're going. So it's a combination of it's a combination of those two: concern that oil prices may not, you know, leg, may not play out the way the futures market says they're going to play out, and so we got to be careful. Plus, you know, the, the 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 desire of some to go ahead and kill the PFD, even even if the facts don't support it anymore. Right. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to number two, uh, Brad. Uh, give me a tease here, and we'll come back to it. We're going to discuss what is the end game, right? Give me a give me a quick tease. So Tim Bradner had, has an article in uh, the Fairbanks or in the uh, uh, excuse me the Natsu Frontiersman uh, that uh, uh, that's a pretty good summation of of where uh, he sees this legislature uh, coming out 
uh, within the three in, in the three weeks that they have left. And it excludes some things that I've been concerned about uh, that I find uh, comforting that uh, are not in his list. Um, uh, but uh, it, ha it has some things that, that, uh, that I want to talk about uh, as, as, as we wind down these three weeks. We're talking with uh, Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the weekly top three. We just kind of went in through SB 199 and we got a quick tease on the end game for this session. Uh, Brad was talking about an article in the Frontiersman lining out some of those ideas. All right, Brad. So give us your thoughts on what the end game is for the end of this session. Well, Tim Bradner has a good, uh, has a good piece on, on where he thinks, what he thinks uh, uh, legislative, legislatively is going to survive uh, uh, or legislatively be accomplished over the remaining three weeks of the session. Um, bills that are in one, one, one body have not yet crossed over to the other body uh, are, uh, uh, are going are gonna to be you know, headed upwind uh, fighting headwinds to uh, to try to get past. It's not say it's it's not to say it's impossible, but uh, uh, if it took you this far into the session to get it out of one body, crossing over into the other body, and then the hearings that have to go on the committee hearings, committee assignments, committee hearings that have to go on uh, before it gets back to the uh, gets back to the to the other body, gets up to the other body, uh, is a is a fairly strong headwind. The two things I've been focused on are the are the from a fiscal standpoint, uh, are the uh, uh, the, the, the the defined benefits uh, proposal uh, that's come out of House Finance has passed the uh, has passed the House and crossed over into the Senate, um, and in the defined benefits for you know firemen and police and others, uh, first responders essentially. But really, that's just the crack in the door to open it for uh, other government employees. Uh, teachers will quickly be behind it, and others behind uh, others behind that. Um, and then the uh, and then and then there's another uh, fiscal bill that uh, that I've been uh, concerned about as well, uh, the BSA adjustment that would adjust the BSA permanently going forward. Um, those, in, interestingly, those aren't on Tim's list as uh, as what he sees uh, likely getting out of the legislature uh, by the uh, by the end of the session. Uh, that means that he's expecting some headwind, some slowdown when it hits the Senate. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think those, I think the house, it, those have been messaging bills by the house members to sort of show that, you know, they're prepared to go forward with all this spending, all this additional spending, new spending, layering on new spending on top of, uh, on top of old spending. Uh, I think it's a good sign that maybe the Senate wants to, wants to slow that down a little bit. There's also maybe the Senate is protecting the governor a little bit. Those are two bills that I would that I would think uh, would get uh, veto consideration uh, if they came up to the governor again because we don't have a long term fiscal plan in place. Right. Um, and, and and why are we committing to additional spending because we don't have we haven't settled the revenues issue, um, and maybe the Senate's protecting the governor a little bit. But but it, it was encour it's encouraging to me to see that uh, those didn't uh, those didn't make Tim's list. The other article that I think is. Uh, worthy of mention in this is uh, Revenue Commissioner Lucinda Mahoney had an op-ed piece uh, in the ADN and uh, and elsewhere talking about uh, you know the, 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 from the fiscal standpoint that this is Alaska's opportunity to to get things done and 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 I guess I view it as sort of the administration's final pitch before we get into these last three weeks of what uh, of what the administration would like but it's just a rehash of the of the old stuff which is you know spending caps, constitutionalization of the PFD, constitutionalization of the POMB draw, moving the CBR into the, into the um, PFD or moving the earnings rather into the, into the permanent fund. So uh, you sort of lock away uh, money that way. Things that the governor has proposed in the past that really haven't gone anywhere in right. either body. Right. Uh, uh, this, uh, this session. <coughs> so it's sort of a, I mean, if that's the governor's final, if that's the administration's final pitch on the uh, on the fiscal front, uh, it's a pretty weak one, uh, and sort of makes you wonder, you know, what the hell, what they think is is really accomplishable, or if if like the house maybe one second, or if like the house maybe, um, 
they're just going into messaging mode now. Right. They're just going to say, this is, uh, well, th these are the mess, the fiscal messages we want. Well, I got to say that one of the things that, uh, that really startled me about this article that was, uh, that was a pertinent here is that, uh, she says, uh, now is the time to convert the Alaska permanent fund to a true endowment fund and constitutionally limit the, the change to the endowment will protect the permanent fund for future. Gen I mean, it, it, I get really nervous when they start talking about changing the whole endowment thing. And maybe that's is that the cover that they're talking about for putting it in the Constitution is to call it an endowment fund instead. I mean, instead of calling it a dividend, now it's going to be an endowment. I mean, it, it kind of changes the whole shape of it. No, she, I think she. I think that part's talking. I don't think that's talking about the PFD. I think that's talking about the fund itself, moving right. the, the the earnings reserve into the PFD, which right. is a part of the governor's or uh, the earnings reserve into the permanent fund, which is a part of the governor's uh, governor's proposal. Basically, it's a it's a backward spending cap, right? If you take money out of the earnings reserve and the and the and the legislature do, can't go get it as a as a spending supplement or as a revenue supplement then you somehow right. help cap uh, their ability to spend. Right, so by, earning, I think that's, I, I, by moving the earnings reserve into the corpus and zeroing it out, essentially the only money's deposited in there every year would be the earnings of that year. And so they couldn't, they couldn't dig deeper into it is what you're saying. Right, right. There would, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be a savings account that they could go draw on. Right. There is one other, there is one other thing in Tim Bradner's uh, piece that I found you know, understandable, but I found it disturbing. Uh, Tim's got his got his fingers on the pulse of the legislature, and he he has for a long, long time, uh, and and is really a good source to go to when you're trying to figure out what the legislature truly is thinking. And he's got two paragraphs in here. There's little talk of this year of a full dividend or one paid according to a formula in the nineteen in a nineteen eighties era statute that is now considered obsolete. If a full dividend were paid this year, it would be over $4,000, according to estimates of the Legislative Finance Division. With oil prices currently over $100 a barrel, that could be afforded this year, Right. the Finance Division has told legislative committees, but it would leave less money for a long list of urgent needs, such as $600 million needed next year to start the reconstruction of Anchorage's port, which is badly corroded and in danger of falling. The, the phrase that, that really, I think, got my attention was paid according to a formula in a 1980s era statute that is now considered obsolete. I don't consider it obsolete. Uh, right. but, but, you know, Tim, as I say, has his finger on the pulse of, uh, of, of a lot of legislators. And, um, and, and I suspect that's, repli that's, that's reflecting what, uh, what he's hearing from, uh, from legislators. Okay. We got about four and a half minutes here. So final thoughts, uh, on the wind down here on number two, we'll give a chance to give a number three tease before we go to the break, but, uh, final thoughts on the end game for this legislature. I think the end game is they'll get some more bills passed, but it doesn't, at least according to Tim's article, it doesn't look like it's going to be the fiscal bills that have concerned me. Um, the administration seems like they're, you know, they've laid out their agenda for the end game, which is sort of nothing, which is sort of, you know, do what you haven't done. <laughs> continue, can, let us continue talking about the things that you haven't done uh, and aren't going to do uh, in these final three weeks. And, you know, and, and we'll use that as our campaign theme. Right. And I think that's it. I think a lot of these people want to get out and get on the trail because now it's the time. So many of these other bills may fall by the wayside. Once they get the PFD and the and the budget bills out, that'll pretty much be the end of it at this point. Yeah, one thing to look out for is is Bert's strategy. I mean, remember last year, Bert held the bills right until the very end in order to put pressure on everybody uh, to uh, to uh, 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 get uh, get out uh, uh, in order to pass what his version of what he wanted before they could go home. Uh, and Bill and Bert still hasn't released the operating budget nor the capital budget out of Senate Finance. The only thing that's come out is the PFD bill. Right. So one one thing to look for is whether Bert starts on his uh, on his strategy move of putting everybody in a corner again. Yeah, we'll be watching for that. All right, uh, got about two minutes here. Uh, give us a quick tease for number three, uh, and maybe just a thumbnail. And that, of course, is the discussion on what is driving Alaskan oil prices right now. Uh, and this includes uh, an Alaska Journal of Commerce article from Elwood Bremer. Elwood does a great job, I think, of, of ferreting out uh, what's going on with Alaska oil prices 
it's compared to Brent prices. Now we know generally what's pushing oil prices up uh, and, and, and what's the controlling oil prices. But Alaska prices have separated from Brent prices in the last few weeks. Uh, and Alaska is now commanding a premium uh, over Brent, which is important because every, every dollar contributes, you know, $80 million additional in revenue to the state. So if we're running ahead of Brent, we're running ahead of the market. Uh, we're, uh, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're in a better position than, uh, than, than where we usually are, which is tied to Brent or a discount to Brent somehow. Right. And Elwood's article does, does an excellent job outlining what that is. All right, Brad, expand on that a little bit. I mean, again, uh, we're seeing Alaska normally the ANS uh, crude normally trails behind Brent, um, and uh, and now we're I think at one point it was nine dollars difference between uh, Brent and and uh, and and uh, ANS or <clears throat> and so uh, that's a you know again uh, we we can make hay while the sun shines if we got the uh, if we've got the foresight to to see it and make it work. Usually ANS trades at a at a discount to Brent uh, over the past few years. Uh, at one point, it was tied uh, it, it, long ago in the past. It was tied to WTI, West Texas Intermediate, the U.S. Uh, 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 oil price. And then, uh, once we were able to trade, uh, sell A and S uh, overseas, uh, it got tied to Brent and has been has been you know one or two or three dollar discount to Brent over time. Since um, since the Ukraine though. Uh, it has gradually uh, increased. Uh, the, the the discount to Brent has 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 narrowed, and in the past few weeks, uh, ANS has exceeded uh, Brent. And what's going on, evidently, according to this excellent article by Elwood, what's going on is that as Russian crude has been taken off uh, and is no longer uh, being coming into the U.S. West Coast. Uh, ANS is being is being pursued now by West Coast refineries um, as the preferred alternative or as the next best alternative to Russian uh, crude. And because of that increased demand for it, not only the demand for ANS as, as it existed before, but but now as a substitute for Russian crude, uh, as that as that demand has increased, the price has increased. Um, if that's true, if that's what's going on. Uh, that should that should last uh, for uh, a fairly long period, as long as um, as long as Russian crude is locked down, prevented from being imported, um, and and perhaps until maybe there's another uh, uh, next best developed uh, Guiana crude or other crudes that are that are coming on the market. But that sort of that sort of premium is significant. To oil price nerds, because it, it tells you that when you look at Brent numbers, uh, you've got to add a little, as opposed to subtracting a little bit, as we've done uh, in the past uh, few years. You got to add a little bit, and uh, and if that if that difference is persistent, that means more revenues uh, for the state going forward. the 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 state's forecast is is a Brent forecast. It's 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 the Brent price, right? Um, and so you're always uh, you're always thinking. Okay, it's a little bit off. We're going to be a little bit off that because of the discount. Now, if this if this development is persistent, we're going to be thinking, oh, it's a little bit above uh, that forecast price because of the premium that ANS is going to is going to command over Brent. Well, <clears throat> it'll be interesting to see. And of course, it's always the crystal ball effect. We don't we can't say exactly how. But now that the United States has basically outlawed all Russian energy imports and it's been concurred with by Congress. Uh, until essentially, I don't know, Russia completely pulls back within their borders. They disarm. I mean, there's there's a variety of factors there, but effectively, it's the lockdown until a president says no more. Um, so it is this way, at least for the foreseeable future. And we're making up for a significant uh, a deficit on the West Coast. I think Bremer says something like 50 million barrels of Russian crude compared to normally 30 million in ANS. So We've got a hole to fill, and if it's coming in at a premium, we've got a chance to make some money. Yeah, exactly right. And <clears throat> and we have occasionally, over the past few years, I track this fairly closely and do a chart on Sundays that that, that show the destination of the of the ANS for that week uh, or for that month rather. Um, and we've had a situation over the past few months where. A, car a cargo or two of ANS has gone to Asia, has gone to China, 
uh, on a fairly regular basis. And, and what's been going on is COVID, COVID shut down the, the, the West Coast market for a while. As it's gradually come back, back, it's not come back to the levels it used to be. So we've had sort of surplus ANS, if you will, that, that we've sent over to China uh, to be absorbed there. So what's going on now is it looks like that ANS is being pulled back to the, to the West Coast. And as you say, pulled back at a premium uh, over, uh, over Russian crude. And that's, as I say, to oil price nerds, uh, that's, a, that's a significant development and one that needs to be factored in in the projections going forward. What are you watching for? Are you watching for the discussion on 199 on the floor this week, or what are you expecting to be watching? I am. I'm going to be watching closely the, the, the discussion on 199. I, I'm, I'm prepared to be surprised at some, disappointed at some senators and surprised at others. Well, I think it's interesting because, again, this bill did not have a guaranteed number of votes to pass on the floor when it came out, which is unusual. And that means that there's certainly going to be some fighting on the floor as to the various uh, uh, amendments that we may see on this. And we might, who knows, we might be, somebody might be able to uh, hijack this bill and do something good with it, but I'm going to hold my breath and uh, uh, see what we can come up with. It's already been quoted. Tom Begich has said they may reduce the amount. They may do all different kinds of stuff. Are you going to like live tweet or anything as you watch this, or are you just going to be following along and then comment afterwards? Well, there will be, uh, I'm sure I'll have uh, have uh, posts uh, about SB 199 as it, goes, uh, as it goes along. I've had several posts uh, already uh, since uh, the Senate Finance passed it on Thursday. So follow, uh, follow uh, uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets either on uh, Facebook or on Twitter uh, if you want to want to see our uh, our thoughts on the on the bill as it as it progresses. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you, and we will look forward to seeing what you have to say next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.